Welcome, everybody, to the Kona Shane Veterinary Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Andy Rourke. Guys, I am here today with the one and only Dr. Doug Mater, and we are talking about his new book, The Vet at Noah's Ark, Stories of Survival from an Inner City Animal Hospital. Guys, this is a fun episode. It's an interesting episode. Dr. Mater is such a wealth of of, of information, obviously, on exotic animals. He's written three textbooks. Uh, this book is, a, is stories. It's stories from his life and career, uh, and it's a one-year a time uh, in his uh, practice life. Man, he's, he's a smart guy. He also gives fantastic life advice, and I just love hearing his insights on our profession, and we get into all that today. So, guys, that's enough from me. Uh, let's get into this episode. This is your show. We're glad you're here. We want to help you in your veterinary career. Welcome to the Cone of Shame with Dr. Andy Rourke. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Doug Mater. Thanks for being back. Dr. Rourke, thanks so much. Always appreciate it. It's always fun talking with you. Oh, you as well. I um, I love having you on the on the episodes. Uh, we, you and I talked, uh, recently we've done a couple exotic medical episodes. We talked about uh, a sulcata uh, that got uh, attacked in a dog attack, and and that was uh, that was one of our sort of recent episodes. And so I wanted to talk to you about things that you have going on that are not clinical cases, though. Uh, you are uh, you are a prolific writer. You are someone that I have read their stuff for years and years and years. You write uh, medical pieces. You write opinion pieces. You write news. You have a regular newspaper column and have for a number of years. And now uh, you have a new book. It is called The Vet at Noah's Ark, Stories of Survival from an Inner City Animal Hospital. And so let, let me just let me start off. Just uh, why don't you lay down your writing resume and origin story for me? How did you get started writing, and and what has that been like? I've always liked to write. I've always liked to read, and uh, I, I started writing creative writing when I back in high school. Been kind of a closet writer ever since. When I got to college, I wrote columns for the student newspaper, and and after college, I started doing newspaper or magazine articles, and continued with actual newspaper articles. I've written three textbooks, medical textbooks, and countless peer-reviewed articles, um, well over 2,000 magazine and newspaper articles. Um, and then under a pseudonym, I've always I've written several short stories, but I've always wanted to write the great American novels, so to speak. So that's a, that's, that's kind of amazing. I love so. when people are highly accomplished in vet medicine and they have a hobby on the side. That's something they do that's, you know, the fact that you write under a pseudonym uh, and write short stories. I, I think is I think is awesome. I think I think more of us should have things that we get away from our regular day to day practice life and, and do like that. Well, I tried to write this book under my pseudonym, and the publisher said no, 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 no. You have to use your real name. So my hero and probably yours and everybody in veterinary medicine probably at some point read the James Harriet series. You know, all creatures yeah. great and small. It's uh, yeah. he was for those of your listeners that aren't familiar with him. He was a veterinarian in England, and he practiced back in the 50s and 60s. And then when he retired in the 70s, he penned a series of books, um, started out with All Creatures Great and Small, and then he had three sequels to that. And he was a veterinarian in the countryside of uh, Yorkshire, England, and it was beautiful rolling green hills and, you know, friendly farmers baking him apple pies. And uh, his story, he was an incredible writer. I mean, just amazing. His stories were engrossing, and you really felt like you were riding shotgun with him as he drove in his old car through the countryside. And, you know, I I probably read all of his books two or three times each just because they were just so well written and all about the human-animal bond. It's, 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 it just was the magnet that took me into veterinary medicine, as, as I'm sure a lot of people, at least in my generation, felt the same way. Yeah, uh, I, I, I completely agree. I, I think... Um... I think one of the things that you have in your writings that are particularly interesting is, you know, you you are at least during the time of, of the writing here, you're writing about the early 1990s, and uh, you you were a, a general practice veterinarian, um, but your your expertise in exotics is enormous, and uh, and you were seeing a lot of exotic cases at the same time, and so I think that that breadth of different types of cases that you see, I, I always think that that's really interesting. I I think this book is particularly interesting in that. 
It's set in inner city L.A. in the early 90s and sort of the backdrop of the Rodney King trial and the social unrest that's going on there as you and your staff uh, navigate cases and also sort of the social unrest that's going on at the time and in the area. Can you talk a little bit just about sort of set the scene for me? What was going on at the time that uh, that you were telling me stories? Sadly, Andy, I mean, the, the social unrest it hasn't really changed. I mean, we still see the same issues all around the country today. Back in the early 90s, for those not familiar with it, there was a horrible, horrible situation where a black motorist was pulled over and then severely beaten by a group of police officers. And it was probably one of the first times that something like this had been videotaped because it was videotaped by somebody standing on their porch with an old video camcorder. And then it got taken to the news stations. And of course, needless to say, once people found out about it, it caused quite a bit of rage and, and mm-hmm. just sadness. And, and, and really, people were upset about the way the whole thing went down. And so there was a lot of tension in the city. There were also some other high profile cases going on at the same time. And so the city was reaching this boiling point right about that time that the book was written. The book takes place over one year. And it was, I wrote it in the first person, so technically it's a memoir, but it actually reads more like a medical drama because uh, mm-hmm. it's written in the first person, but it's really about the human-animal bond. And I like to make the analogy that I wanted to tell a story in a fashion similar to the James Harriet stories back in England. The difference, mm-hmm. though, of course, is where he drove a car through the beautiful rolling green, grassy hills and countryside. My situation was inner city, concrete, gangs, graffiti, drive-by shootings, hookers, uh, yeah. drugs, you name it. Um, but the common glue was that human-animal bond. And it's yeah. living in a situation like that and trying to do the best you possibly can to take care of people and their pets and prolong that bond. And there's some very trying circumstances. It was it was a challenge. So hence the name of the book is uh, you know, The Bed at Noah's Ark, Stories of Survival from the Inner City Animal Hospital. And, you know, there were there were some scenes, there were some episodes that were pretty hairy. So, yeah. so far, the only criticism I've received, and everybody that's read it, all the reviews have been extremely positive, but one person said they, they thought it was sad because of the whole situation of what was going on in the city and everything else at the time, which is true. And it's still yeah. sad today. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I, I think that that, um, I always love, I always love stories that have a, a, a backdrop that, that is, that is interesting and, and it can be poignant and it can be challenging. But I, I think, um, I think as a lot of people look at the book today and they think about where our world is now and, and there's a lot of sort of, um, you know, existential uh, anxiety, I think that a lot of us have, I, I think in a way, it's, it's, it's nice to see that that times have been hard in the past, and, and that uh, the human animal bond rises above and that we have a role to play, and we can do things that are that are meaningful and important. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. You're, you follow a, a number of different clients and a number of different cases as you sort of go through kind of in the style of James Harriet. So that was always my favorite thing is uh, he, he would talk about the clients that it, that he has. And it was always amazing to me that I would read this set, you know, in the 1800s England, and I would say, I know those people. Those people walk into our into our clinic today. And so I just, uh, people are people, are people kind, of, kind of wherever wherever you are. Are there stories, are there individuals that, that you talked about in the book that, that still stand out in your mind? Uh, do you have favorites? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I think you know, I've been a veterinarian. I've been in this profession now for almost four decades. And sadly, you know, we, we remember some of our success stories and we remember some of the clients that are more colorful, so to speak. But for me, a lot of the things that I remember are the cases that didn't go well, because those are the ones that haunt me. Those are the ones that I lost sleep over. And, you know, there are some cases, just like in human medicine, you do everything you possibly can. Face it, it's a hospital and animals come in, people come into hospitals, they don't always go home. And that can be difficult. And, and it's one of those things that does lead to burnout. And I think surrounding yourself with a great support group, uh, and that would include staff, uh, family, and friends, it helps you get through the bad days. And, you know, do I have favorites? Yes, I have favorites. You know, there, there's some cases, uh, this one's not in the book, but I had to do a house call, and it was a little old lady. She had to be in her mid to late 70s, and she had a pet 
Congo fire eel that she kept in her bathtub. And she had it there for 20-something years. Now, I, I don't know how long Congo fire eels normally live, but it was actually in heart failure. And this woman loved that eel. I mean, she had it there in her bathtub. I Granted, it's probably not the most natural place to keep a fire eel, but you yeah. know, she fed it every day at newer, um, and she was devastated. It, it did eventually pass because it was in heart failure. And especially, you know, way back then, I don't know about you, but I don't have a ton of experience treating cardiac disease in Congo fire eels. Nope. So we use what we learn in our dog and cat medicine, and then we try and apply it across species to some of these unusual animals. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely, you hear about the young kids going into veterinary medicine, like, oh, I don't want to be a doctor because I don't like people. But, you mm -hmm. know, the animal part is the easy part. It's dealing with the clients is where the challenge can really come in because the animals want you to help them. And oftentimes you have to get past that stone wall of a client to a get them to allow you to treat the pet the way it needs to be treated. Hey guys, I just want to jump in with a couple of quick announcements. I have got to thank Banfield the Pet Hospital for making transcripts of this podcast possible. Guys, in an effort to increase inclusivity and uh, accessibility in our profession to get people the information and, and to make sure everyone is included, Banfield has stepped up and made this uh, tr made transcripts possible. You can find them at drandywork.com. Thank you to them. This is something I wouldn't be able to do without their help. God, it makes me so good to be able to offer this. Over at the Uncharted podcast this week, me and Stephanie Goss are talking about, are you toxic? We got a letter in our mailbag from a veterinarian who is not happy at work and they are giving suggestions and feeling shut down and they're kind of resentful of it. And they're saying, am I a toxic? person here because I'm starting to feel kind of toxic. Uh, if you've ever been in this situation, this is a great episode to check out. Get it wherever you get podcasts. That is Uncharted Veterinary Podcast. And it is this week. It came out yesterday, July the 13th. Hey, gang, let me ask you a question. If you could make clients easier to handle for your veterinary team, would you do it? Would you make clients uh, the client experience better for yourself and the people that you work with? Well, if your answer is yes, I just want you to know that I have worked really hard to help make this happen. I have two online on-demand courses in the Dr. Andy Rourke store. One of them is all about charming angry clients and the other one is all about building trust and relationships with pet owners. Uh, guys, I, I worked really hard on these. This is the culmination of over a decade of lecture that I have done around the world and working on these topics. Uh, it, is, it is my best stuff broken up into five to 10 minute modules that you can just drop into staff meetings. You can put them wherever you want. It does not have to be a big deal. You can use them in morning huddles, but it is a way that you can keep giving your people tools just to make their lives easier because that's what they're all about. If you're interested, head over to drandywork.com and just click on the store button and you can see what's there. Uh, I've also got uh, what's on my Scrubs card game, which is just something fun, little team building educational activity that, uh, that might make your people laugh. Anyway, I want you guys to know that that's there. I hope that you will check it out. In the Uncharted Veterinary Community, guys, we're doing a workshop that I'm super proud of. It is my friend, the one and only Dr. Amanda Doran, and she is doing a workshop called Navigating Neurodiversity, Your Clients, Coworkers, and Self. This is all about navigating interactions with different people and creating a culture that is supportive of neurodiversity in the workplace. Guys, this is not a workshop that I have seen before. I am super excited to have it. I think these are conversations we need to be having. I'm really proud to be a part of the Uncharted Veterinary Community uh, and being able to help bring out workshops like this. As always, this workshop is free to our Uncharted members. It is $99 to the public. I will put a link down in the show notes. And now let's get back into this episode. If you could go back and talk to yourself in the early 90s, is there advice that you would give yourself as you were going into this period? Yeah, I think, you know, I know probably most people don't make mistakes, but I certainly made more than my fair <laughs> share of them. And I wish I had the knowledge uh, back then that I have now. And I probably wouldn't make the same mistakes, or if I did, I'd have a better ability to handle them. I guess the, the one of the biggest things I could tell young doctors is, you know, know your limits and don't overstep your limits and don't be afraid to reach out for help. You know, if you have a case that's difficult, you know, call an expert, get a second opinion, refer it out. It's, it's nothing wrong with that. 
Oh, okay. I want you to unpack that a little bit because when I look at you, um, I know you didn't have formal training in the areas of expertise that you uh, excel in today. I mean, you are, in my mind, the picture of the doctor who tries things, who, you know, who, who educates himself and steps out and does these unique things. Your, your breadth of experience is just amazing. And so how do you, how do you balance that, um, know your limits with uh, what seems, when I look at you and, and kind of the impression I have of you as someone who continues to push and grow and who's not afraid to do new things and try new things and educate yourself, how, how, do, you, how do you square those two things? And how, how would you say that to, to a doctor? Well, it's different. You know, in the last 35 years, things have changed quite a bit. Um, I did, just to kind of set the record right, um, you know, my residency was in primate and zoo medicine. We didn't do a lot of reptiles back then, um, but I also became very good friends with a veterinarian, a veterinarian named Dr. Fred Fry, and he was probably mm -hmm. the grandfather of reptile medicine. He wrote the first two books on it, and we met at a bookstore. I didn't know who he was. We became friends before I knew who he was. And then he kind of took me under his wing. So I was very fortunate in that, I, although I didn't have formal reptile training, I, I did have a friend who was probably one of the best reptile veterinarians in the whole world. So, but to answer your question specifically, there, there will be crossroads in your career where you have a case, whether it's a dog, a cat, a budgie, or a reptile, that it needs help. And you may mm -hmm. never have done it before. And you say, okay, I'm going to refer this to a board certified avian specialist. Um, and the owners go, I can't afford it. Or it's too far away. I can't, I can't take six hours and drive to the vet school or to the nearest specialist. And so you may have to try it. But I think the important thing is you need to be really upfront with the client and say, you know, Mrs. Smith, um, Fluffy here has got a kidney tumor and we need to go in and try and remove part of the kidney. I've never done this before. Um, if you want me to try it, I'm willing to try it, but be aware that I'm straight up with you. This is new to me. Now, legally, if things go wrong, you're still held potentially liable, even if you tell them that. Um, so whenever possible, you always want to try and reach out. But you know, Andy, the beauty of today is people like you. You've got a podcast. You help teach people. Um, the internet is amazing. I didn't have that in the early 90s. I couldn't quickly look something up on the internet. You dig out the books and you hope that you could find it in a journal or a book someplace. Now you can pick up the phone and there are so many services available where you can consult with experts in any different specialty area and come up with a plan. So maybe I can't refer Fluffy up to the University of Florida, which is eight hours away, but I can talk to one of the experts there and they can kind of walk me through it. So um, we do have a lot more available to us, lot the tools now that we didn't have back then. But you're right. Sometimes you had to do things for the first time. What's your perspective of where vet medicine is going today? Uh, you know, you, you, you tell stories about the past and, you, and you're still very involved in our profession. Are you optimistic about the future of practice? Do you, do you see this uh, continuing on as, uh, as a wonderful profession? Do you, do you have concerns? Uh, as, you, as you look at the landscape and sort of reflect back on the stories from your own career, what are your thoughts on the future? Well, let me rephrase your question. If I had a okay. chance to do it all over again, would I? And absolutely, I would. I, I, yeah. I love what I do. I love waking up in the morning. My goal is to do what I can to help the human-animal bond. Um, and let me expand on that just to finish answering your question. Yeah. You know, the human-animal bond is, is the little kid with their pet kitten, or it's the old man walking his dog in the park, or it's the, the guy with the leather jacket and the snake around his neck. Um, it could also be... You and I going out doing photography and taking pictures of a bald eagle, um, that's still a bond. Or it could be the family going to the local zoo and looking at the animals at the zoo, that's still a bond. And so the human-animal bond is really a broad category. And whether I'm helping the woman with her bird that's got the kidney tumor or I'm working with fish and wildlife and fixing a wing on a bald eagle that's been shot, I'm still doing something to help that human animal bond because then you and I can go back out there in two or three months and see that eagle fly by again and take our pictures. So I, that's, that's just what keeps me going. So to answer your question, because I, I know I'm t talking in circles, would I do it again? Absolutely. I love what I do. I love the people. Um, I love working with the animals. I love the technical challenge. Um, 
I love surgery, endoscopy, ultrasound. I, I love all of that. Now, where is it going? That human animal bond's not going away. You know, yeah. people will always have pets. And even people that don't have a lot of money still have that desire for companionship. And it could be a goldfish. You know, I know you, you've had bad days. We've all had bad days. How many times have you come home and you picked up the cat and you just hold it until it purrs? And what does that do? Yeah. It drops your blood pressure, centers you, makes you find your zen. Um, I used to have pet fish before the hurricane. And my aquarium was six feet long and it ran the length of the wall by my front door. And when I get home at night, all my fish would be waiting in the corner of the tank by the front door. And as I walked <laughs> past them, I'd say hello. And they would all swim down to the other end of the tank, waiting for me to put my backpack down or whatever I had to do so I could come back and feed them. Now, of yeah. course, did they love me? I would like to say yes. Yes, yeah, sure. Did they know of that I'm the guy with the food? Absolutely. But the bottom line is those fish depended on me. And it always made me happy to be able to feed them and watch them enjoy their meals. So answer your question, I think the profession is here to stay. Uh, it's changed. We have a lot more specialists now. You have a lot, a lot of people out there that can help you get through difficult, challenging cases that you had to struggle through before, sometimes trip and fall. Would I do it again? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I would highly recommend to any young student coming through a technician that if you want to do this, pursue your passion because it's good. That's a, that's great advice. I love that answer. The last last question I have for you is, do you have any advice you would give to someone who uh, has always dreamed about, about writing? Uh, they, they see, they've always, they've always kind of like you, they had, they had an interest from the beginning. And I, I think a lot of people struggle with fear of putting themselves out there or um, thinking that maybe I, why would anyone want to read what I have to say? I mean, do you have advice for someone who, who thinks that they might enjoy it, but has not uh, picked up the pen? I think if you like to write, the key is you should write at least a page a day. I, I learned that years and years and years ago. So I keep a journal. So the, the story, by the way, I just happened to have a copy right here. Here's your <laughs> nice. photo op. Um, I mean, the story is true. It's a true story. Everything in there it comes out in my journal that I kept. And so the dates, the timelines, the people, the pets, uh, it, they're all real. I changed the names of most of the people in the book out of privacy reasons. Mm -hmm. People that were in the news like Rodney King and a lot of the people that were in the news back then, the public figures, their names are all real. But write. That's all. You just have to write. Um, they say you're not a writer until you've written at least a million words. And to put that in perspective, one typed page uh, is 250 words. So do the math. Okay. Um, so I, I, I have long since passed that. I'm probably up well over 2 million words by now. And the thing is, you can always get better. You know, It wasn't that long ago I signed up for an adult education night course on creative writing just because it, you can always learn, just like in veterinary yeah. medicine. You think that, oh, I know it all. But, you know, then you go to a conference and you're always learning new things. So if you yeah. like to write and you want to write, just start writing. You know, keep a journal, keep a diary. Doesn't mean you have to publish it, but the more you write, A, you're going to have good memories. You'll have stuff you can go back and reference. And then down the road sometime when you get old like me, if you want to turn it into a book, you've got all that stuff already there. You just have to reword it so that it's in a story fashion. Yeah, that's yeah, that's it. I love that advice. Dr. Doug Mader, your new book is The Vet at Noah's Ark, Stories of Survival from an Inner City Animal Hospital. It is available in hardback and on Kindle. I will put links in the show notes. Uh, where can people find you online? Uh, DougMader.com. Uh, if you go to my website, then there's links there right to the book, and you can actually purchase the book uh, through my website via the publisher or any number of online booksellers. All the major brick and mortar booksellers like Barnes and Noble are carrying it. So it's fairly easy to get. Awesome. Barnes and Noble has it out right now. It just came out last week. Uh, for some reason, Amazon, it's going to be out on July 12th. Um, but it is out there and it is available. Um, and so far, like I said, people seem to like it. The New York Post listed it as required reading, which was quite humbling and quite an honor. I never expected that. And I was pretty pretty flabbergasted because right next to me was James Patterson. So I'm thinking, oh, wow. that's good company. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Well, congratulations. Uh, I, I am super excited Thank for you. you. I'm super excited about the book. Guys, I'll put links to all these things in the show notes. I hope you guys will check it out. Everybody take care of yourselves. Thanks, Andy. I appreciate it a lot. 
And that is our episode. Guys, I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks to Dr. Doug Mater for uh, for being here again and put links to his book in the show notes. I hope you guys will check it out. Um, gang, take care of yourselves. Be well. See you soon. <laughs>